Hi everyone, it's Ed. To celebrate the 100th episode of Excited Utterance, we've now added a merch store to our website, complete with Excited Utterance cap, t-shirt, hoodie, and mug. All items are sold at cost and available at excitedutterance.com store. Also be sure to check out our special Sea Monster apparel line. Excited Utterance, the Evidence and Proof Podcast, episode number 100, 99 episodes of Excited Utterance. Welcome to Excited Utterance. I'm your host, Ed Chang from Vanderbilt Law School. Excited Utterance is your podcast for cutting edge scholarship and developments in the world of evidence. We bring virtual workshops to you throughout the academic year. This week marks the 100th episode of Excited Utterance. So rather than having our usual guest interview, Alex and I will celebrate by having a conversation about the podcast as a whole. We review the last 99 episodes of Excited Utterance and talk about the podcast's origins, memorable moments, trends in legal scholarship, and the future. I hope you enjoy this discussion that looks both to the past and to the future of the podcast. Well, Alex, happy 100th episode. I kind of find it hard to believe that we've had 100 episodes of Excited Utterance. I think this recap was really your idea, so let me let you lead off with the first question. Well, thanks so much. It's great to be here in kind of this different role. But it's amazing. I mean, I think back to, what was it, 2015, 2016, where this idea really had its formation. I remember I was a 3L at the time, which is crazy to think about. In your office, I think, talking about you know my aspirations to be an evidence scholar, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, Ed, but I think this whole project really perhaps had its inception in a few different constellation of factors. But one of those factors certainly was my desire to rope you into something of a reading group or just have you recommend evidence pieces that I should read, right? And that kind of kicked us off. Yeah, so we definitely had a reading group. And I think at the same time, I was listening to a whole bunch of podcasts on my way to work and driving my kids to school. And I was also thinking that flying around for a lot of these workshops was a bit wasteful, both in terms of time and cost, but also that carbon footprint of them where it was pretty high. (laughs) So I, rather than starting an evidence series, for example, at Vanderbilt, I thought, well, we could do a podcast and maybe we could get a, a wider and more specialized audience through a podcast. And that's kind of interesting, too, because if we remember that time period, I mean, podcasts now, they seem relatively commonplace, right? Podcasts are everywhere. But I distinctly remember that this was something of a novelty at the time, because I remember when you first proposed a podcast to me, and there was like the serial podcast just now taking off in 2015, 2016. But in terms of an academic podcast or podcasts about legal topics, it was, it was pretty much an open frontier. Is that right? I think that may be. I'm pretty sure that it certainly wasn't a super popular thing for people to do, and it just seemed like a really good fit technologically for what we wanted to do. And I think it was a way to get a workshop without doing a regular workshop or to get a symposium without getting a symposium. And imagine my surprise when I thought I would make a good impression as a 3L by heading to your office I'm asking for a list of articles to read, and a few months later, I'm now in a podcast. Quite the transformation for me. Certainly had to internalize that. But of course, I'm incredibly grateful for it. But so it's so funny to think about. <laughs> so I think your role on this podcast has evolved a lot over oh, yeah. the years. I, it began as this RA that helped me go through all of the literature and try to find people to interview. And now you you host it just like I do. What's the transition been like? I mean, it's been, I think, an incredibly transformative experience. If you think about the breadth of that transformation, when 
I started on the podcast, as you know, I was just an RA. I was reading articles, sifting through papers, trying to pitch them to you, thinking that they would make a good podcast. And from there, there were inklings as I went into my fellowship where you said, hey, you know, you know, you maybe you should host this episode. Maybe you should host that episode. And I feel like initially I was thinking there's no way. There's no way I could be good at this. Right? There's no way that um, I could actually talk to scholars who know exactly what they're talking about or experts in their field and be able to have like a, a 30 minute intelligent conversation with them. But at the same time, what happened is I feel like my skill set started to develop and, and my development as a scholar kind of paralleled the added responsibility you were giving me on the podcast. And then it kind of culminated in this experience, I think last summer, when I was interviewing one of my evidence students, Katie Hicks, for the podcast. So I'd come full circle from the RA pitching papers to the professor. Now I was the professor interviewing my RA. It's been an awesome journey, I feel like, because the growth of the podcast and the growth of my responsibility in the podcast just paralleled my academic trajectory generally. So here's a question for you. I would imagine that some of our listeners would be curious. Any particularly funny moments that happened in your interviews? I don't think that you kept, and I certainly don't keep a blooper reel, but some of the stuff has been edited out. Anything that comes to mind on that? <laughs> Too many to count. So first and foremost, I'll say that, you know, I was just talking about my development and my added responsibility on the podcast. I remember those first few interviews that I did. I was so incredibly nervous to try to get this stuff all right. And I wish there were like a camera on me behind the the microphone for some of these podcasts, because I'm sure I was like sweating, asking like the most basic questions, right? Just, you know, whenever you are in one of those moments where you want everything to go perfectly, I'm sure it was just ridiculous how overly concerned I was with with making sure everything went well. But also, aside from that, you have like the weird moments in interviews that are always quite humorous, weird sounds emerge, I, I swear. We could be in a soundproof room, and the moment we hit record on this podcast, all sorts of sounds will find their way into that room, right? At least that's been my experience. It's like I, I'm in my office. I haven't heard a peep for three hours, and then the second I record with someone, a lawnmower goes right behind my office, or an ambulance screams by. Uh, I'm not sure if you've had that experience, Ed, but I, I don't know if it's selection bias or if it's actually a phenomenon for podcasters, but I, I feel it deeply. So the one incident that sticks out in my mind is an early interview, and it was actually the first one that we published with Dan Capra. So back then, I actually did some in-person interviews. So I was in his office, and we were conducting the interview, and two of his colleagues decide to have the most boisterous conversation right outside his door. And <laughs> it's very early in my experience here, so I didn't really know what quite what to do. And Dan turns to me and he says, they should go away, right? And I said, yeah, that would be great. And so I, I stopped the recording <laughs> and he went out there and in very classic Dan fashion, he sort of, in a very curt way, basically said, look, I'm having an interview here. You guys go somewhere else. And it was just this comical thing that it's something that I certainly remember. One thing that was interesting was that all the equipment that I had purchased, ultimately, they made no difference. That huh. all that noise that seemed to be extremely disruptive to the interview did not come out in the recording. And so it, we could have recorded straight through that. Of course, it would have been distracting, but it, w it wasn't really a problem. It's actually disappointing to hear that. I think that would have added a nice little flourish mid-episode, right? So that's the <laughs> funny thing, this. too, is that you know all those things have been cut, and I never uh -huh. thought twice to keep them. Yeah. Well, I'm sure there has to be a greatest hits of all the times I have mispronounced a word when asking a, a question. I remember I was interviewing Julia, and there was one word. I don't know if it was inadministrable or some word with far too many syllables. Um, but I just couldn't say it. I, I tried like four times. And on the fifth take, I just changed the word. But of course, the listeners never, I mean, that's the benefit of this medium, right? On the back end, it, it sounds good. Now, of course, there's also this, this meme that has showed up <laughs> among some of our interviewees. And on this, I am pointing my finger at specifically Jeff Bellin 
and Bennett Capers, and then maybe Brandon Garrett, they wanted very much when they answered the question of welcome to the podcast or good to have you on the show, they would say, I'm excited to be here. And that became something of a joke. And I thought that was just a personal thing that people did. But of course, then at a, at a conference, I remember Jeff and Bennett laughing about it, that they said, yes, you did it too. I can't, I can't imagine <laughs> that you did that. Or I was waiting for you to do that. I think, so the question I have in my mind is that have people incorporated this as part of the meme or does it just sound right? Because I'm almost <laughs> positive that Julia in the most recent episode said, I'm excited to be here. It's interesting because it's kind of like a natural, it's perfect, right? The perfect crime because it's a natural thing to say, but also you suspect that there's some intentionality behind it. I know that when I interviewed Jeff just this past season, he made it very obvious. I think he said something like, I'm again excited to be here, emphasizing the again excited. So I'm curious, you know, in a bit, we'll talk about our forecast for the next 100 episodes. I predict a lot more individuals expressing excitement at the beginning of their interviews. So let's, let's move to some substance. What are the trends that you've seen on the podcast or in evidence scholarship more generally over the last five years or so? Yeah, so I think that this is one of the most interesting aspects of serving in the hosting role on the podcast is, of course, Ed, you and I are sifting through pretty much every evidence article that is released, and it has been released over the past few years. And this has enabled us to really kind of have our finger on the pulse of the trajectory of evidence scholarship. And one that I'm going to gravitate to initially is an area Ed, that you and I have written on ourselves, and that's the area of machines and technology. Here, I know that Ed and Winkle read, of course, prolific author. He's written about source code and the implications for source code in the courtroom. Of course, you have Andrea Roth's uh, Yale Law Journal piece, Machine Evidence, Mary Fan and Body Cameras. And I think that this is going to be a really interesting source of scholarship, not only presently, but also in the years and decades to come. Because I think what we saw in our project, Ed, is that technology is increasingly shifting the paradigm in the courtroom. So perhaps where in the past all evidence would have its reliability depend upon a person or that person's subjective observations, increasingly what you're seeing is machine-based reliability or machine-based accusations even. And I've been fascinated with the implications of how this is going to fit into a courtroom paradigm that was, of course, created without any of it in mind. Kind of an interesting trend that I've noticed. So I think technology is a very natural move. I think you tend to have a lot of scholarship on new technologies or current events that have shown up. I think another natural move in the evidence area, which we've seen a lot of on the show and in scholarship, is the use of psychology. So lots of psychologists on the show, ranging from Darren Strange first season to Tess Neal last season. We talked to Bobby Spellman about her book with Michael Sachs about psychology and the law of evidence. Tom Lyon has been on the show talking about child witnesses. There have been many, many other psychologists or people who do psychology and the law on the show. I also think that aside from just the fact that we have a lot of psychology, how the psychology is being used shows something of a trend as well. People are using psychology to question some of the folk wisdom that has traditionally underlain evidence law. Here I'm thinking about Tim Lau's piece, which thinks about present sense impression. And he's also written about the excited utterance rule and how the psychology works with that. We've had some articles about gruesome photographs. So there have been many episodes that have talked about psychology and how evidence law might change or how we might better understand proof by understanding human psychology. And I think kind of zooming out for just a second, that interdisciplinary focus, at least where you see psychology and evidence law intersecting, it kind of reflects a broader intersectional commitment in evidence law. I think here too, and I think back to 
our episodes on forensics where we see a similar interdisciplinary type of approach where knowledge claims from usually a scientific field are coming in to inform forensic evidence in the courtroom. I know we had Belina Beatty on, Jen Olivia, I think Benjamin Blum also talked about forensic evidence. And that's just a couple of them. And I'm actually, as I think more and more about this, Ed, I now recognize we had just had Marvin Zalman on. We had Aaron Murphy, of course, talking about DNA evidence. I'm curious, as I as these pop into my head, if you plan for a forensic focus, because it seems like it, we're perhaps overweighting in that direction. And I'm not sure if that's just reflective of the trajectory of evidence scholarship right now. So I can neither confirm nor deny <laughs> that I'm actually filling our lists with forensics. I actually think that I can plausibly deny the bias there. Yes, I do expert evidence largely, but I tend not to work in the forensic side of things. I've written only a few things in that area. I think actually that you see a lot of forensics pieces in the literature, partly because of that technology thing that you were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. but also because it's just the continuing aftermath of the DNA exoneration movement that we're not done with the innocence movement and people continue to try to understand why it is that we have wrongful convictions. And so you get a lot of forensics there because one of the big culprits is the problems that we have with forensic evidence. So Alex, one last theme I think that I've seen is character evidence. So character evidence obviously is a big deal. Hearsay is also a big deal, but seems to me that there's a recent push toward re-examining some of the really traditional and classic rules about character and credibility. Rule 609 has been maligned for many years, but I think there's a newfound interest in getting rid of it or worrying about it. Anna Roberts talks about that. There is a piece by Rick Simmons that we talked about also. And then, of course, Julia has, uh, Julia Simon Kerr has the piece about credibility and how credibility is not necessarily the same as character for truthfulness as the rule writers have tried to re envision or at least recast the credibility rules. Yeah, I completely agree. And I really enjoyed my interview with Julia on her new paper. I think it was unmasking demeanor. And I was talking about the role that mask wearing, obviously caused by COVID-19, would have on credibility determinations, given that facial expressions largely would be, of course, concealed. And that's a theme, of course, specific to the COVID era. But I think you're right. When you look at the breadth of scholarship from Julia to, to Anna Roberts to Rick Simmons, it's a fascinating area. And I think that this is a, an area where cultural perceptions, certainly around 609, but even around character evidence generally, has evolved since 1975 and the codification of the federal rules of evidence. And the question is going to be, what room will there be for reform? Any favorite episodes? I don't know. It's hard to say. I mean, I, I think I have a strong recency bias. I think this is a good thing. I think if you asked me five minutes after every single one of my interviews, I would have said that was my favorite interview. Because I don't know if you've experienced this, Ed, but I think uniformly our guests do a really wonderful job of expositing their ideas. And I just feel often privileged to be able to, to listen to them talk about these really cool pieces. That was kind of a pivot, right? I was, I was not trying to pinpoint one or the other. But, but I mean, that's what I feel. I, I don't know that I have any favorites. I just think that many of them are fascinating. Okay, so no favorites. What about regrets? things that you would have liked us to do? Hmm. Well, I think we had a conversation about this just a couple of days ago, and we were talking about how there are so many kind of preeminent evidence scholars that we haven't had on the show yet. And that is emphatically not because of a perception that we don't find their work interesting, but of course, it's because of a commitment that we made on the show from day one, I think, Ed. And I think um, you know what I'm talking about here. Yeah, so... We always focus on a specific piece of recent evidence scholarship, and 
I think the result is that there are many people who have made significant contributions over the years that we don't feature because that work was in the past. And in some ways, I think of, in particular, Rich Friedman's work on the Confrontation Clause, which, of course, is probably over two decades old, Ron Allen and the whole movement about uh, abductive reasoning, which, again, is also decades old. And so we haven't had them on for those propositions. I feel like having the unavailability workshop has allowed us to make up for some of those gaps where we could have a lot of these senior scholars talk about things that they know a whole lot about, but may not have written about that particular issue recently. Yeah, and I think that that also, too, has been uh, kind of a very fascinating evolution of this podcast project. I know that we talk quite a bit about it, but one of the things that I've most enjoyed about this, both the Excited Utterance podcast and the Unavailability Workshop, which is kind of an online synchronous component to the the podcast with a, with a little bit of a different scope, but is just the opportunity that we've had to to bring different evidence scholars together in a way that was only possible maybe once or twice a year prior to the advent of these different initiatives. That's been a lot of fun for me, especially as a junior. So here's another place where I think we have had something of a gap. I think there's been lots of really interesting work done over the last couple of years on the nature of proof. And we really haven't covered it. And it's not because our podcast is focused only on doctrine or rules, but rather that it's often hard to talk about proof in this format. I feel like proof has this epistemological aspect, this philosophical, technical aspect to it. And it's just hard to do it in the audio format. I think this would be true also of more technical, statistical type or empirical work. Although with the empirical work, sometimes you can just get at it by focusing just on the results without getting into the nitty gritty of how the methodology worked out. And I think in the, the spirit of full disclosure too, there are, I mean, we're a two-man crew, right? Kind of a skeleton crew sifting through these papers. So I think it's fair to say that for a couple of pieces, we just kind of missed them. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts on pieces that fall in that category. Well, yeah, there are a couple of regrets I have here. So one piece which I definitely regret having lost in the shuffle is Jill Lepore's piece on the history of Fry. I have no idea how that happened, I think what some of our listeners may not know is that another standing rule about the podcast is that we don't feature articles that have been published for more than, I think, two years. So if it's more than two years old, then we won't feature it. And for whatever reason, I did not figure out that we had not done that piece until that time frame had elapsed. I think the other big work over the time period that we didn't feature was Deb Turkheimer's book on shaken baby syndrome. And I think that may have been caused by the fact that the book was released close in time to when we started the podcast. And so we just weren't being very comprehensive at that point. You had a bad RA at that time. I had a bad RA at that time. Right. So it's your fault. AKA and me. I will tell Deb <laughs> that it was your fault on this. Okay. So we always ask our guests what's next for their project. And so as we wrap up this particular episode, I think the question for us is twofold. What's next for legal scholarship? Where will it go? And what's next for Excited Utterance? So I'll start with the, the former question first and what's next for legal scholarship, because this is something I've been thinking quite a bit about given kind of current events. And, and it's just increased attention to epistemology and how people go about arriving at conclusions. I mean, what we see when we look around the nation today, oftentimes people will point out that it seems that people are reaching widely disparate conclusions. They're looking at evidence in incredibly different ways. And is that the result of 
confirmation bias where they have disagreements about, you know, say, political issues or scientific issues? Is that the result of some other epistemological shortcoming? And something that we've recognized, Ed, is that these individuals who have incredibly different forms of epistemology outside the courtroom. They're coming into the courtroom, of course, as jurors. And so I think that there's going to be increased attention to fact-finding in the courtroom, given the fact that outside the, the courthouse doors, there's so much disagreement about how do we go about arriving at what is truth. Surely that's going to come into the courtroom, and I think that that's going to have a big effect on legal scholarship in the, the years ahead. Of course, it's music to my ears. I obviously (laughs) love the question of how we figure out scientific issues in the courtroom. And so that, that sounds good to me. I think it's hard to avoid the possibility that at least over the next five years that the pandemic is going to affect evidence scholarship as well. So you already see a lot of new scholarship coming online about virtual trials. You mentioned Julia's piece about mask wearing. Susan Bandis and, and Neil Feigenson have a piece out on virtual trials. The pandemic has made us rethink or at least see alternatives to the way that trials are conducted. And, you know, in many cases, I think it's also very efficient to have A lot of these proceedings occur in an online or a Zoom type format. And I think that evidence scholarship will probably deal with those developments in the coming years as well. That point also kind of raises a second issue in my mind, because I'm thinking about Zoom trials and I'm thinking about confrontation over Zoom and whether that is sufficient, constitutionally speaking. But it raises the broader issue, I think, of confrontation jurisprudence generally. We were just talking about this in an unavailability workshop a little bit ago about since the last major confrontation clause Supreme Court decision, we now have three new justices, Justice Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, and Barrett. And it'll be interesting to see their views on confrontation. Of course, all evidence scholars know that confrontation is not entirely a clear area of Supreme Court jurisprudence. Oftentimes, it inspires unorthodox coalitions among the justices. The opinions themselves are often fragmented and less than clear, I think it's fair to say. It'll be interesting to see when we get that next big confrontation clause case, how the new justices uh, approach it and, and what that does to the field. So the second part of the last question is the future of the podcast. And Here, I'm going to answer my own question. I think there are three things that I see. One is, I think we'll see more unavailability workshop. The name is slowly and and hopefully becoming outdated. So I kind of envision the unavailability workshops transitioning into something called Excited Utterance Live, where at least in the breaks that between winter break and summer break, we'll have opportunities to do a synchronous session where we talk about various evidence issues so it wouldn't be in the regular podcast format. And I think that will supplement the podcast nicely. The second is we talked about this at the end of the evidence summer workshop last year, but There's been some desire for an evidence winter workshop so that people can present work twice a year uh, in this kind of format. I think what we'll see post-pandemic is hopefully a summer workshop, which is in person. And I think, you know, we all like having the ability to see each other that way. But then a winter workshop that would be virtual. And I think that's just purely out of convenience that There's only a limited amount of time during the winter break, and so doing a virtual workshop has a lot of efficiencies. It also deals with problems like weather and travel-related issues during the holiday period. And then finally, just speculating, but you and I have talked a bit about a project for the evidence community more broadly re-examining the rules of evidence sort of in a wholesale way, given the social science 
that we have today. And I think this ties into a lot of the themes that we talked about over the course of this episode, uh, including the new technology, including the virtual trials and what COVID has taught us about evidence and proof, and also the psychology literature that continues to make inroads into how we make sense of the world. I think all three of those are exactly right and admiral goals. And I think they dovetail nicely with something that we talked about all the way back to our first day about being a goal of this project. And that's just our overarching goal of fostering a strong evidence academic community. And I think about the Evidence Summer Workshop, I think about Excited Utterance, where we're able to hear workshops from individuals weekly during the academic year. I think about the online conferences I think it, it it signals bright days ahead for our community. I think that I feel very privileged and honored often to be able to be a part of this community. But I think that these are different vehicles for coming together, sharing ideas, and just refining our work. And I think there's a lot to be excited about, not to overuse that mean. Well, Alex, it's been an eventful almost five years and 99 episodes of Excited Utterance. Thanks for all your help on the podcast, and I look forward to the next 100 episodes. Can't wait. I'll see you at uh, number 200. From the very beginning, I think it's safe to say that I had three major goals for Excited Utterance. The first was to promote evidence scholarship to a broader audience. And on this score, it has really exceeded my wildest dreams. At last count, we had almost 10,000 weekly subscribers. And from not only the sheer numbers, but also the notes that I have received over the years, I know that the podcast reaches far more than evidence professors. Our listeners include judges, practitioners of all types, students, and even non-lawyers who are just interested in learning more about the law. For that, thanks to all of you, our loyal listeners, and please keep spreading the word. The second goal was to provide a regular and more efficient forum for distributing and consuming evidence scholarship. And I think that over the last 100 episodes, we've demonstrated that we can do this. We can share evidence scholarship in a fun way without necessarily flying around the country at considerable cost in time, money, and carbon. Yes, the pandemic has made it also abundantly clear that we do like seeing each other in person, and I'm sure we will continue to do that but there are also other avenues for communicating on a regular basis. And finally, the last goal was to contribute to a sense of community among evidence scholars. Our sense of community is one of the things I treasure most about our field. And while this is for you to judge, not me, I hope that Excited Utterance has helped to do that as well. Certainly for me, the podcast has enabled me to meet and become friends with many more of you, And for that, I am extremely grateful. With that, happy 100th to Excited Utterance. And I look forward to having more fascinating conversations and to making more friends in 2021 and beyond. Support for Excited Utterance is generously provided by Vanderbilt Law School's Brandstetter Litigation and Dispute Resolution Program and the University of Arkansas School of Law. The associate producer is Alex Nunn, and the production editor is Grace DiPietro. Additional production assistance is provided by Francesca Rutherford, and music is provided by the Vanderbilt University Blair School of Music's Children's Cello Choir under the direction of Kirsten Castle Greer. I'm your host, Ed Chang, and I hope you'll join us again next time when we take on another new work in the world of evidence and proof. Thank you.